the sutta we chanted just now, setting the wheel of Dharma in motion, was the Buddha's first sermon. And sometimes it's asked, where's the wheel? It's not mentioned in the sutta itself. And there are two explanations. One is that the wheel was a symbol of power. When a king could get on his chariot and drive his wheels wherever he wanted to, that was the area that was under his power. Wherever the wheel was stopped, that was the limit of his power. And as I said, this wheel of Dharma that the Buddha set in going cannot be stopped by anybody. So this indicates the power of the Dharma. But there's also that passage where you have the mention of the Four Noble Truths and the three levels of knowledge with regard to each truth. And it sets out all the combinations of the three and the four. In English, we call that a table. In Pali, they call it a wheel. And this is the wheel of Dharma. As the Buddha said, when he knew the Four Noble Truths and the three levels of knowledge appropriate to each one, that was when he was able to claim that he was gained full awakening. So the Four Noble Truths, of course, are the truth of suffering or stress, and the Pali word is dukkha. The origination of suffering, the cessation, and the path to the cessation of suffering. In the case of suffering, it's basically boiled down to clinging to the five aggregates. The Buddha never said that life is suffering. It's one of those fake Buddha quotes. He says something a lot more useful, pinpointing exactly where the suffering is. It's not because there are unpleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. It's because of our clinging to certain activities that we engage in. Even form, the first of the aggregates, the Buddha defines with a verb, it deforms. Feeling, feels, perceptions, perceive, fabrications, fabricate, consciousness, cognizes. And we cling to these activities, we feed off of them. That's where the suffering is. That's what we've got to focus on. So knowing the suffering, or knowing that first noble truth is one level, and then knowing the duty with regard to it, and that's really comprehending it. And it doesn't mean just understanding the words. It means understanding the actual suffering that you find in your heart, to the point of dispassion. We don't think that we're passionate for our suffering, but all too often we cling to things that entail suffering. And we've got to figure out where the clinging is why we're attracted to it, and then we can compare the attraction to the, the actual drawbacks, and that's when we can let go. And when we let go, that's the full comprehending. The second noble truth is the truth of the origination of suffering. The word origination here means the cause, but the Pali word also means something that arises together. In other words, you're not going to be looking into your past lives for the cause of your suffering or the far distant past. You're looking for something you're doing right now. And the Buddha identifies the origination with three types of craving. Here again, there's a misunderstanding that he said all desire is a cause for suffering. But actually, there are some desires that are part of the path to the end of suffering. The desires that lead to suffering or desire for sensuality, becoming, and to destroy becoming. And because we're thirsty in these ways, this is why we feed off of the things that we identify with, that we cling to. So the duty here is to abandon them. Sensuality, craving for sensuality is not so much craving for sensual pleasures as craving for the mind's activity of fantasizing about pleasures. We engage in that a lot more than we do in actual, than actual partaking of sensual pleasures. You can think about a meal for a long time before and a long time afterwards, even though the meal itself doesn't take all very long. 
And that's what we're really attached to. Craving for becoming is craving to take on an identity in a particular world of experience based around a desire, hoping to use that identity within that world to attain the desire. And craving for non-becoming is when you've taken on an identity in a world of experience, you want it to end. You want to stop it because it's not getting the desire you wanted. These are the things that cause suffering. Here it's important to note that suffering in the Four Noble Truths is very different from suffering in the three characteristics. In the three characteristics, the stress of changing things is built into the way the world is. It becomes suffering in the heart only when you cling to those things. And that's suffering in the Four Noble Truths. The suffering in the three characteristics can't be changed. But we can get rid of suffering in the Four Noble Truths so that the changes in the Things around us don't weigh on the heart. And that's a good piece of good news. We don't have to perfect the world before we're going to put it into our sufferings. We can clean out our hearts. And that's what puts the end of the suffering. So when you've abandoned the causes of suffering, that completes the third level of knowledge. In other words, you know that the truth, you know what the duty is, and then you've completed the duty. So that's six spokes in the Dharma wheel. As for the cessation of suffering, that's the abandoning of craving. And with that, the abandoning of, or the release from suffering. In other words, you find what the cause of the problem is, and you solve it at the cause, and the results take care of themselves. You don't go around trying to put an end to suffering by abandoning it. It'd be like going into a house, seeing that there's smoke filling the house, and you're trying to put out the smoke. As long as you don't put out the fire, the smoke's going to keep on coming, no matter how much you try to put it out. If you find the fire, put it out, then the smoke take care of it, takes care of itself. And so you hear, see here that the Third Noble Truth is actually performing the duty with regard to the Second Noble Truth, letting it go. The duty with regard to that is to realize it. In other words, it's something that you actually see happening in your own heart. And then finally, with the fourth noble truth, that's the path to the end of suffering, the Eightfold Path. The duty there is to develop it. And once it's developed, then you've completed all twelve spokes. So that, those, that's the Dharma wheel of the Buddha. You basically engage in the activities that will put an end to suffering by attacking the cause. His Dharma wheel has twelve spokes. How about your Dharma wheel? Hopefully we all know the, the Four Noble Truths, at least as they're explained, and that's the beginning. Then there are the duties, and then the act of completing the duties. That's our work. So right now we're developing concentration, focusing on the breath. That's working on the duty with regard to the Fourth Noble Truth. Everything in the Dharma can be found in the Four Noble Truths and their duties. In other words, everything in the path. Because knowing about the Four Noble Truths, even though we may know them thoroughly and say, yes, it's true what the Buddha said, is not the goal of the path. These truths are meant to take you someplace. This is why it starts with knowing the truths and then having duties to perform, and then knowing what it's like to complete those duties. They take you someplace. That's another reason why it's called a wheel. It spins along the path. And the more spokes you have, the more reliable the wheel is going to be. So look at your practice. Have you been able to identify where in your mind is the suffering? We have that chant that says, those who don't discern suffering 
And at first, the first time around, it sounds strange. Everybody can discern suffering, you might say. Well, everybody has a sense of suffering, but they don't really discern it. They blame it on all kinds of things that are not related to the five aggregates, or clinging to the five aggregates. Which means even though they, dis they suffer, and they may suffer very strongly, they don't discern it. And this is what we're working on here, is to get the mind in a place where it can really discern the suffering. This is one of the reasons why I have to get the mind so quiet and alert at the same time. Because when suffering happens, it's very hard to sort out exactly where it is and actually to perform the right duty, which is to comprehend it. Because our main reaction to suffering is trying to push it away. And we push blindly, pushing at the wrong things. So we've got to get the mind quiet. This is why in another, <clears throat> another sort of the Buddha identified the important factor of the path is right concentration. And all the other factors are its supports and requisites, as he called it. Because it's when the mind is in right concentration that it can actually perform these duties. Now, these are not duties that the Buddha imposes on anybody, but he says, if you want to put it into suffering, notice it's conditional. If you want to put it into suffering, this is what you've got to do. There's no other way around it. But remember, right concentration is provisional. It's part of the path. It's not the goal. There's still some becoming in here when you take on an identity as a meditator. And there's still going to be a sense of self then. So there will be some clinging, but it's useful. If you're taking a chariot down the path, you've got to hold on. If you let go, you just drop there on the road. So every effort that gets put into practicing concentration, and that includes fostering the desire to do it right. It's all to the good. There's a passage where Ananda is teaching a nun. And as he points out, we practice to put an end to craving, but there's a certain amount of craving that gets gets us there. In other words, we hear that other people have put an end to suffering. We hear that the Buddha's Dharma wheel is complete. And we look at ours, and it seems to be like a a mouth with missing teeth. We say, he can do it, I'd like to do it too. That's part of the path. It's part of right effort. He also says that we practice for the sake of putting an end to conceit. But we have to use conceit of a healthy kind in order to put an end to conceit. The healthy kind, of course, is Seeing other people can do this, they're human beings, I'm a human being, if they can do it, why can't I? So remember, the path is provisional. We take on a certain identity, we take on a certain goal, we have a certain desires that we foster, we take on certain levels of becoming. Because they take us across. Remember the image of the raft. You have to hold on to the raft, even though the raft is not your goal, you hold on to it. And once it takes you across the river, then you can let go of the raft. If you let go in the middle of the river, you get swept down by the currents. So even though there's a sense of self that you're using right now that you'll abandon, there's a desire, there's a level of becoming that you're ultimately going to abandon. They're simply what you've got to do. You can't use nirvana to get to nirvana, because nirvana is not the kind of thing you can use. Where would you get a handle on it? You've got to make, make use of what you've got. And right view is there to remind you this is how to use it well.
So we hold on to the chariot as the wheel takes us down the path. As I said, the more spokes you get in your wheel, the more solid it's going to be, the more reliable it's going to be. This is why we, every night, we're not sitting here and discussing the Dharma. We're sitting here meditating. We're trying to work on those duties to get them done so that our Dharma will be complete. And it'll take us where we want to go.